What's up, guys? This is DDP back with another Mavericks post game show, and here we are. The Mavericks have avenged a very nail biting loss early in the year to the Portland Trail Blazers. Didn't get bit in the ass by a coach's review this time, although there was a late coach's review that did make me have a little bit of a PTSD flashback, if you will, back to that game in the first week of the season. All the same, Dallas gets a 120 to 112 victory at home where they have not won too terribly much this year. Just a few games over 500 at this point. They get a much needed victory, however, over the visiting Portland Trail Blazers. And yeah, I know this season hasn't really gone the way a lot of people expected it to for Portland. And, you know, part of that is even though Dame is Dame. And they've got some other really nice parts as well. McCollum, of course. Bazemore's not bad. Hassan Whiteside's got his moments. He balled out in this game, and he was a huge impact. But the Blazers still sit 10th in the Western Conference with a record now of 18-25. and 25. Meanwhile, Dallas, while still technically 6th, they are sitting at 27-15. and 15 And basically, in a tie with the Rockets at the moment... I'm not sure. There's got to be some tiebreaker scenario that's giving that to the Rockets because we're undefeated within our division right now. So regardless, we're right there with the Rockets uh, back for the fifth place spot. This is a good win for Dallas. This is a big game out of Luka, 35-8-7. He put on a clinic in the first half, although Dallas started very slow in this game. Dallas got off to a pitifully slow start, 0-5 from the field, fell behind in the blink of an eye, 12-2. And I think they were as behind by 11 was their biggest deficit in the first half. And yet, after all of that, they still recovered, caught fire. And then by the end of the first quarter, they actually had a one-point lead at, I believe, 38-37. So it's incredible that Portland got off to this quick start, just boom, 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 punching us in the mouth. Dallas can't get anything going. Rick Carla has to burn an early timeout. And then he comes out, or the team comes out after that. And make some serious headway, make some things happen, and puts together the kind of first quarter we need. We've talked about this before. When this team scores 30 or more points in the first quarter, we are really tough to beat. It's when we got off to a slow start and we're in the middle of the 20s or even the low 20s that things get a little bit sketchy for the Mavericks in this case. So big, big first quarter for the Mavericks. Big response. They carry that momentum on then into the half. And Luka's got 23 points at half. He's balling out. Lillard, however, also balling out. I want to say he had 25 at that point in the first half. I mean, he was immediately going in this game. And that was pretty significant for them because Lillard, you know, he only gets nine in the, if my math is right, if I'm correct that he had 25 uh, in the first half. He then gets nine in all of the second half. That's pretty big. Although you could say, hey, well, Luka only got at that point, 12 in the second half. True, but shut up. Luka made plays at the end. So the Mavericks, they got going. They got a huge performance out of Tim Hardaway Jr., 29 points, stepping up and being not just the number three guy like he is a lot of nights. He stepped up and became the number two guy, 29 points, 9 of 16 from the field, including 5 of 8 from beyond the arc. That was huge for Dallas, especially when they came out of that timeout and had to start getting some momentum going. You had Luka really dragging the team there, but Hardaway Jr. hitting some shots as well. And that was pivotal for this team to actually be able to hang in this thing. Meanwhile, Seth Curry, he started off abysmal 0-4 from the field. But you know what? His shooting percentages aren't sexy in this game, but he ends up still giving you 16 points. And he did eventually find a little bit of a rhythm and make some nice plays for you there. Not just shooting threes. I think he was only 3 of 10 on threes. But he made some plays happen. I mean, he had some pull-up jumpers. He got to the rim a couple times and made some things happen. Just a series of good plays. But I would be remiss if I did not give some credit in that first half to Jalen Brunson. And Brunson really in that third quarter, too. Uh, Brunson, 13 points on the game. This is probably one of his better games we've seen in a little bit. He's been kind of that guy fading into the background in recent weeks. And you've seen very inconsistent minutes for him as a regard. It's still not like, here's the thing, like at one point he had a stretch of seven points by himself for the Mavericks and that was big, but it wasn't like he was just a, a battery for this thing the whole time because while he does give you 13 points and deserves full marks for that, full, uh, fully commended for that performance, 
He's still 5 of 10 from the field, so adequate, not great. 1 of 1 on 3, that was really nice. Uh, 2 of 2 at the line, but 3 turnovers in 19 minutes. So he had himself a good performance, but I don't want to overstate it. He was very important for us in that stretch run there when we really started to take control of the game, but it wasn't a complete performance necessarily. That's all I'm trying to say. I know there are some people who uh, get frustrated. I don't you know, have more patience with Brunson or anything like that, but a quality game for him, especially considering uh, recent performances and all that. So Dallas, in this case, the bench wasn't great. Like you got 16 out of Curry, 13 out of Brunson. That's awesome. But other than those two guys, you only got three points out of DeLon Wright. And yeah, DeLon Wright, one of four from the field, 0 of two from three, one of two at the line in 15 minutes. Not anything to write home about. It's those two guys. That is your bench scoring. You get nothing out of Justin Jackson in 21 minutes, which by the way, oof, dude, you're giving us nothing in 21 minutes. You only attempt two shots, 0 of two on three. That's not good. That's not good. So I get it. It's not a super deep bench night for the Mavericks, but the Mavericks are a much, their advantage coming into this game was the bench compared to Portland's bench. Portland is one of the worst benches in terms of points production in the league. They don't have a whole lot beyond their starters. And yet in this case, Dallas, Dallas's bench outscored them. Uh, Simmons, let's see, for, for the Portland bench, you got Simmons with seven, Trent with three, uh, Hazola with seven. I'm, I'm sure I botched that. His on, he's on you. There you go. He's on you with uh, seven and Tolliver with three. That's your performance for Portland's bench. So more guys scoring, but the production still falling less than the Mavericks here. It really for Portland came down to what they could get out of their main guys. Like I said, Lillard, 23 points, or excuse me, 25 points in the first half. Huge performance out of him. Whiteside was a monster in this game. 19 points, 18 rebounds, five blocks, including, I mentioned earlier, a coach's challenge within the final three minutes. That was pivotal, I thought. Tim Hardaway Jr. attacking the basket aggressively. It was called a foul. They reviewed it, and they came back and instead said, no, you know what? And here, I, I want to call this out specifically, not just because of the scenario and how it had a chance to swing things in Portland's favor, but I want to call this out because I don't like how the rule is set up. So even if it hadn't been called a foul on the floor, fine, then it's a block because that's what you're telling us in the review, that it's a block. But the ball clearly goes out off of Hassan Whiteside at that point. So why then do we set up for a jump ball scenario at half court with freaking Hassan Whiteside and Tim Hardaway Jr. Like you took what was you took what was basically a 50-50 call and you're now changing it to being a substantial advantage for Portland in that case. To me, it should have been Dallas ball under the basket because Hassan Whiteside blocked the shot. I understand that you could say, well does he block it and then it rolls off of Hardaway's fingertips? I felt like looking at the replays, you see it go off Whiteside's hand last. Maybe if there was just better communication of that there, I would feel differently about it. But it seems like I've seen in that scenario play out a couple times this year where they undo uh, a foul call saying, no, it's a block, and then their solution is to set up a jump ball at half court. And you're like, well, dude, I had a guard attack the rim and get blocked by the center, so now that's their advantage. I digress. Uh, this was... This was a big game for Hassan Whiteside, and he had a chance to really wreck shop. Now, I will say this, as I'm talking earlier, as I'm talking about uh, replay, Luka Doncic got called for one of the worst flagrant one calls I've ever seen. Worst as in, like, that shouldn't have, like, that's a common foul, sure. Luka's driving the lane. He's trying to do his Euro step, and as he's clearing out, I'm going to gently bump my mic to illustrate this point. Here's Hassan Whiteside's chin as he's clearing out for the Euro step to go, you know, behind his shoulder basically to get behind him, get the angle he needs. His elbow clips him on the jaw. They review it, and rather than calling it a common foul, they call it a flagrant one. That is a garbage call. Garbage. A flagrant one has to be an intentional or excessive call it has to look like an aggressive move in that case it's not like Luca had a straight line here to the basket but decided nope I'm going to try and take his head off not at all what happened terrible call I felt 
didn't end up mattering, but that just kind of showed uh, the two sides of that there. Because later on, you had Hassan Whiteside. They reviewed a foul he had on Maxi, where it was a loose ball foul on a rebound, where Hassan Whiteside pretty clearly looks like he's, you know, he's swimming through, but he kind of throws Maxi to the ground, and it, it's kind of like a a whiplash effect there as he just swings him to the ground. And after review, they kept that as a common foul, and you're like. That looked a lot worse than the Luca foul earlier, but you called that a flagrant one, and now you're calling this a common foul. Whatever. It ended up not mattering because even when Hassan Whiteside went to the line in the first half to shoot the two free throws, he bricked them both because, uh, hey, basketball karma, and even though he's shooting 70-plus percent from the free throw line this year, for his career, especially his last year in Miami, he was like a 45% free throw shooter. So say what you will, basketball karma, ball don't lie, whatever. It is what it is. So, shout out as well to the revitalized Carmelo Anthony in this game. 22 points, 8 of 16 shooting. Like, Carmelo Anthony, give credit to former Mavericks assistant uh, Terry Stotts here. He's kind of found a way to rejuvenate Anthony because Anthony's last couple years were not very good at all. They were very forgettable. In OKC, I mean, you could include some of his last years with the Knicks, but in OKC being the third guy, he was not... Very good. In fact, when they got to that playoff series against the Jazz and uh, Donovan Mitchell, they they couldn't even play him towards the very end of that series. They basically had to bench him because he was that much of a liability for them defensively, and he's still a little bit of a liability there. Still not a great rebounder despite being a small forward in this case, but it's still something where he was hurting the team, and even though they lost that series in six games, they're like, we got to get this guy off the court right now because he's too much of a liability. Then he goes to Houston last year, plays 10 games with the Rockets before they cut bait. And he just sat out there the entire year as a free agent. Was a late pickup then for Portland. And Terry Stotts has made him pretty pretty damn good in this case. He's had some big moments, and he comes up with 22 points here. Pretty efficient shooting, 8 of 16. Let me take a look here on his threes. Uh, only one of four on threes in this game. He's been close to 40% shooting threes, they said, during the broadcast, though, for the season, which is crazy because that's a higher efficiency rating than he's done really throughout his career in that regard. So credit credit to Portland there. Their starting lineup for Portland gave us problems. So the only guy I don't have listed on here was McCollum. This, this was significant. McCollum leaves the game in the first half with an ankle injury. He plays only 12 minutes. Uh, two of six from the field before he exited four points. And that's a significant thing because McCollum and Bazemore and Lillard, that three-headed monster, hooked us previously. And, yeah, they wrecked shop on us a little bit. Nine of the last ten games, now at, after this game, ten of the last 11 games against the Blazers have been single-digit finishes here. So this is always a, a matchup that's close, even when, when the Mavericks had some really bad teams. If you go back like two or three years ago, um, well, if you're going back two or three years, then you're probably extending just beyond that. But even when the Mavericks weren't very good, this was a matchup that tended to be very close. But usually you have Damian Lillard cooking the Mavericks uh, in the second half as opposed to doing most of his damage in the first half. And, you know, it, it has a big impact on the finish of this. Usually you got Dame, the the penultimate clutch player, essentially. And Luka hasn't been super clutch this year, but he made some big plays late. He did. I mean, you got the step back three with like 45 seconds left. That was pretty much a dagger and pushed the lead to 120 to 111. I want, no, 109. It was an 11-point lead at that point. So you had that. That was significant. Uh, Dallas's offense, they went cold after you had that replay uh, on the foul overturned to become a block Dallas's offense went cold but they started making some plays defensively they started getting some steals Tim Hardaway Jr. stole a very lazy pass from Carmelo Anthony down into the post uh, a couple block shots at the rim they were rebounding well and it's like even though the offense went cold it's like defensively somewhere that we haven't really talked about the Mavericks much this year as they're rated in the bottom half of the league defensively they stepped up they stepped up and they closed the door to make sure they held on to this win. They moved to 12 games over 500 for the first time this year. So even though even though there's a lot of games that we've lost that we're like, hey man, we probably should have won that game. You know what? It is what it is, but we are standing taller right now record-wise than we have uh, than we have this year. 12 games over 500. So 
This is a good one. This is a good one. Uh, enjoy it. We got a few days now before the Mavericks play again. They will play Tuesday night against the Clippers. And that's of note because we might or might not have Porzingis back. He obviously didn't play this game again. And they're going to give him a few more days. We'll see if he's ready for that Clippers game. But uh, they're telling us they don't think it's a setback per se, but that they are still encouraged that uh, it might have just been a weird, wonky kind of fluke. Like as Rick Carlisle called it, a he didn't say malfunction. What did he call it? A glitch, essentially. Uh, that because he had been doing good in the days leading up to it, got the treatment, that it was just like a little like twinge and like, oh, wait, nope, nope. Okay, back to cautious and then check them out. Okay, I think we're good again. Proceed. Hopefully that's the case because this team really needs his interior defense, his rim pr uh, protection and rebounding have been sorely missed on this team and his ability to space the floor. Although they've gotten nice performances in the meantime. You know, I, Bleacher, or not Bleacher Report, it was a... Uh, it was clutch points. Had a, a post or a graphic the other day that I've, I kind of rolled my eyes at, and it was like, why, why are we looking in this case at, you know, like, oh, who needs KP basically when you look at Dwight Powell's shooting in the past seven and a half games? Like, that's not the role that KP really brings best to this team, though. It kind of feels like a weird step or stretch or whatever. And so, you know, Powell in this game came back down to earth a bit. Three of six, eight points, six rebounds in 28 minutes. Nothing sexy in this game for him. Uh, he obviously had to deal with and contend contend with uh, Whiteside, who just gobbled up boards and all that. So as you kind of joke Bleacher, or I keep saying Bleacher Report, clutch points, as you kind of joke about like, oh, who needs KP or who, who misses the unicorn? Like, mm, dial it back just a little bit, bro. Dial it back. It's okay to say Powell had a good stretch of games shooting the ball and that he's been playing well um, here as of late, but don't don't get it twisted and act like our second best player is not, in fact, our second best player. But anyway, that's going to do it for my time on this post-game show, guys. Oh, wait. Actually, you know what? Before I do that, I want to dive real quick into the final stats here. Dallas shoots under 50% for the game, 44% compared to 52% for Portland. That's only of note for me because... They said during the broadcast, I believe it was the radio broadcast, actually mentioned, Chuck Cooper's team, mentioned that the Mavericks in the last six games had had five performances shooting at least 50% from the field. So the fact that they get a win despite being six points, or sorry, eight point percentage points lower than Portland in this case and sub 50%, I think is pretty solid for Dallas. Much, much better shooting threes, seven threes in the first quarter, including, or not including, but culminating in 20 for the game, 43% from beyond the arc for Dallas, 20 of 47 compared to 9 of 30 beyond the arc for Portland for 30%. Dallas got to the free throw line and converted them rather well, 22 of 28 for 79%. Portland was 15 of 22 for 68%. These two teams hold on to the ball very well. Dallas is the second best team in the league in terms of fewest turnovers, and they said Portland was fourth. Portland actually had fewer turnovers as well, 12 compared to 13 for Dallas. So that held largely in place with where it is, just a tick lower than both teams' usual averages. Uh, Portland out-assisted Dallas, 25 to 19. Dallas slightly out-rebounded them despite Hassan Whiteside's best efforts, 43 to 40. Dallas did get more offensive boards, though, 15 to 8. Hassan Whiteside got all five of those blocks for them, as opposed to four for us cumulatively. Dallas and Portland equal on steals, and Dallas committed fewer fewer personal fouls. You just had the three technicals on Portland, essentially, whether it was three-second violation or what have you that resulted in a uh, you know, bit of a swing there for the game. So very good win for Dallas. You know, I know Portland kind of whittled it down, and Dallas went cold offensively, but in the end, they stepped up. They did what they had to, and uh, we should enjoy this one. But... For real this time, that's going to do it for my time here. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, buy the shirts on represent.com, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.